Patch notes. Destiny 2 update 7.2.0.4. Activities. Crucible. Fix an issue allowing for exploitations of spawns and rift. Fix an issue where you can weaken other guardians when the rapid fire ranger artifact perk is active. Ah, okay, okay. That was only supposed to be, well, in the past, it's only be applicable inside of PvE, but okay, that's been fixed. Seasonal. Fix an issue where the arc attunement runes could be destroyed with certain weapons. Crote is in. Improve essence of the oversold drop rates for full clears and for repeated clears. All right, that should be hopefully substantially better. I'm still trying to get the catalyst. I know many of you are trying to get the exotic. The drop rate for those essences, though, were off. We're going to be engaging it today, though, when we're doing Master Crota's in though. Now, Altars of Summoning. Fix an issue where the Void Crystal Encounter would not progress if the crystals were destroyed too quickly during the third phase. Now, Gameplay and Investment. Abilities. Fix an issue where players could activate their Glaive Melee while in Weave Walk. I, I thought they had already fixed that, but okay. Uh, armor. Fix an issue where changing a mod on an equipped item during an equipment locked activity could boot you from the activity. Fix an issue where the damage resistance from Elemental Embrace was applying to damage done in PvP. So that's been fixed. We're not supposed to be getting damage resist inside of PvP. Fix an issue where the jolt from Arc Elemental Orbs was applying to game objects. Fix an issue where the Seekin filaments were granting overload anti-champion to weapons that were already having anti-champion intrinsically. So what I was hearing was that with Seekin filaments, there was an issue where you could actually double dip. So I guess they fixed that. Now, weapons and accessories. Fix an issue where changing a mod on an equipped weapon or equipped item during an equipment locked activity could boot you from the activity. Fix an issue where Husk of the Pit and Idolin Ally would be missing their weapon fire sound effects on console platforms. Added the Wendigo Grenade Launcher and Hung Jury Scout Rifle to the Legacy Vanguard Ops Focusing. If you want a very good scout rifle, get a box breathing Hung Jury, guys. It kills. Like, what is it? 0.67 seconds inside of PvP? It's disgusting. Now, power and progression. Fix an issue where the minor arcana and powered rewards didn't function as intended. Opening a season of the witch chest while using a witch's key at the end of the legendary Sabbath Inspire will now properly give a deep sight seasonal weapon if there are any remaining to find. Otherwise, it will give a high stat seasonal piece of class appropriate armor. So overall, should be better on the reward side of things. And then general, fix an issue with the Bulbul Terrain Emblem, in which it didn't appear in game and couldn't be equipped. Was there anything about the bug? Was there anything about the crafting bugs being fixed? Or did they did they mention that in another patch? All right, I've got the updates. Let me let me put us in the queue. Maybe the TWAB is going to talk about it. All right, so it's my understanding Master Crotazin is still coming out today. Am, am I right? We're still on for today, correct? All right, to add on to those patch notes, by the way, for those that were wondering, like, what about the whole crafting problem this was actually posted yesterday update with 7.2.0.4 update for tomorrow which is today weapon crafting will largely go back to expected behaviors illegitimate frames and perks on crafted weapons will be replaced with legitimate ones and any attempt to craft new out-of-bound weapons will kick the player to the login screen so if we happen to get crazy or anyone's trying to get crazy where they're taking one frame and putting it on another frame you're gonna get kicked to the login screen i still feel like someone's gonna figure it out but we'll see how that plays out now with these fixes fixes we feel comfortable releasing the master code is in raid mode and checkmate control modifier and crucible laps this is what is launching today we're gonna be jumping into master code is in in just a moment now i'm also being told that the exotic pyro gale has been activated is that confirmed Pyro Gale is back. Yes, they are re-enabled. They didn't add it, though, into the patch notes. Okay, y'all let me know if anything else has happened in the patch notes that I need to know about. Test the broken shotgun. No, it's not. Mungie's already stated. See, look, look, look. Under your skin, my, my busted bow. It's got its normal perks on. Another week, boys, and another twab. This week at Bungie, we're talking the crafting. We're also chatting about the awesome new Jump Master campaign with the Bungie Foundation and Team Rubicon. Diving into deterministic recoil changes, treasuring the treasure that awaits and more. But first, let's do a quick recap of what we talked about last week. So last week, the reason for legendary shards depre depreciation in the final shape, aka legendary shards are dying. They're going away, fellas. Spin them now. How many guardians completed Crota's in? Crota's in first challenge and massive difficulty starting. 
new PvP strike team previews for Season 22 and 23, checkmate entering the Crucible Labs, improved trial weapons, dro weapon drops for wins. Now, topics for this week. Jump Master campaign has landed. Crafting shenanigans, what happened? Terministic recoil, what is it? And why is it so heckin' cool? Treasure Vault Adventures await. So we heard you won it. Adorn Catalyst? The Pelhar awaits. The team had a little too much fun with the new supers coming out in the final shape. A little bit of lo-fi and everything better. Now with Eris. Prime Gaming Update. Yeet the Smolen Fun Clip. All right. For veterans, by veterans on Tuesday, the Bungie Foundation launched a veteran-focused campaign in partnership with Team Rubicon to showcase support for those who serve and help provide humanitarian aid to communities facing crisis. The campaign, which runs until the end of Season 22, features an all-new emo design and collaboration with veteran Bungie employees called Jumpmaster. All profits from the emotes, available now in the Eververse, will be split equally between the Bungie Foundation and Team Rubicon. Let's take a look at this, guys. Bungie. I was a U.S. Army combat medic. Most companies support veterans in some form or fashion, but to have a company that willingly says, we want your voice to be the thing that's heard, is just amazing. I got a call to help pitch ideas for Veterans Day. Of all the emotes we came up with, this is one we actually kind of stuck on. What sells the idea of being a soldier? And it was that idea of the jump master telling you to jump out of the airplane. It's this thing where being the guardian, putting on the headphones while being inside the plane, saying, go, go to these to these little I ghosts as they decide to paratroop out. Ah, that's it dope. felt just flawless. We were trying to do something to recognize veteran service. Let the company be the amplifier and let the veteran's voice be the thing that comes across. I think Bungie does a great job of that. Oh, that's great, man. That's great. I like that. Now, in addition to the emote, the Bungie Foundation premiered their Cleaning the Path film. This is most of the story highlights the partnership with Team Rubicon, a special wildfire mitigation operation that Bungie employees and veterans took part in, as well as the personal story of one of our veterans. Take seven minutes to watch the video and learn how Team Rubicon and the Bungie Foundation are supporting veterans and helping rebuild communities before and after disaster strikes. Watch the full film and get more details on the campaign in last Tuesday's blog post. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. By the way, new emotes as well, guys. Now, the crafting. A larger problem than anticipated. Am it right? Oh my God. Hey, Guardians, this week has been a week. Am it right? As some members of the community have dubbed it the crafting. The issue that allowed exotic and legendary via weapon crafting to be Frankenstein into something ungodly and powerful was certainly a doozy. While fun for a while, our priority will always be to ensure the long-term health of the game. Our teams worked hard to not only get the appropriate fixes in place, but also to communi com communicate with you each time each time strides toward a fix were made. We saw a lot of players ask, why not just do? And we thought this might be a good opportunity to show why issues like this aren't always as simple as they seem. To continue the transparency, we've got folks from various departments that worked on this issue here to give a little peek behind the curtain. Let's dive right in. A previous bug allowed stale data from other crafting recipes to bleed over, which allowed crafty players to move traits from one recipe to another. We learned about this problem on Friday and worked over the weekend on both a short-term content fix and longer-term code fix. At Bungie, we say teams are stronger than heroes, and that was exemplified in this weekend's work. Engineering, design, test, and leadership were all involved every step of the way. For our short-term fix, we have a live update process which we can use to modify content in the live game. However, content and code are two different things, and the bug itself was in code. While we worked on both solutions in parallel, we prioritized possible content-only solutions that would fix enough of the issue to give us some more time to work on the code solution. Other than only supporting content changes, LUPs also have other limits. Number one, LUPs have limits on the amount of content that can be changed. However, we do have a method of predicting the size of each element of the content fix. This required us to build a live update which contained the changes and then see if it was above or below the size limit. Number two, LUPs only allow us to modify existing content. They do not allow us to add new content objects as part of the fix. That is, we can update existing text in an Excel sheet but cannot add new rows. That's a good example. Number three, LUPs only support changes that affect the UI in very specific ways. And number four, only a single LUP can be active at once and we have to include all new and previous LUP changes as a whole. Now, due to limitation number one, 
we knew we needed to constrain the size of the lot. However, the scope of the problem was vast. All crafted perks were potential problems, as well as every crafted weapon. We obviously could not disable every weapon in the game, so we decided on two options. Disable crafted or enhanced weapons. Disable perks from being active on crafted or enhanced weapons. Now, the first step was to create gating logic that would only apply to perks on crafted and enhanced weapons and could be easily toggled on and off in case of something went awry. Since we can only edit existing content and not add new content objects, and we needed to support both crafted and enhanced weapons, which are quite different in their internal construction, this logic took a while to create and test. Now, after a number of false starts, we landed on a work set of logic that incorporated both options and began to evaluate them in a test environment before pushing them to the live game. We started by testing the first option that disabled equipping the weapons, but quickly ran into issues. Number one, weapons that were equipped appeared to be disabled in the UI, but some behaviors of the weapon were so active. Number two, we didn't have time to test whether leaving those behaviors active was safe or not. And number three, there is an unequipped functionality that exists for items, which we then attempted to use, but discovered it simply did not work. Fixing this would require a code change, which LUPS don't support. Now, with disabling equipping weapons not being a, being a viable path, we began investigating the second option, disabling the perks themselves. Again, while we knew there were LUPS limits, we did not know if modifying all the weapon perks would hit this limit. We threw a Hail Mary and decided to gate every intrinsic and trait perk. We didn't look at the other perks like barrels and magazines since we don't, didn't consider them as much of a problem for the short term. When disabling the perks, we also set the tooltip behavior of the perks to appear disabled so that players would see a visual indication in the game. As stated earlier, LUP does not support changes that modify the UI in certain ways, but we did not know this when we were building this LUP. This initial LUP attempt fell early. We exceeded some size limits, some of which we only found at the point of failure, and we failed completely due to having changes that modify the UI. I know this is a lot right now, guys. We're, we're continuing this, but this just tells you how big of a bug this is. Now, at this point, we had to start from scratch. To avoid the UI failure, we would simply not modify any existing visibility settings of the parts. Since we didn't know how much we exceeded the love limits and we were running out of time for new attempts, we targeted a far more conservative scope of perks that we would gate. And among other issues with this approach, the main problem was that while we had examples of bad combinations of perks, we did not know all of them and we didn't have time to gather more information. We knew we would miss some. And we also knew that if we disabled the most popular perk combinations, players would simply move on to other combinations of which we did. We agreed that this was an, an acceptable risk as this was not designed to be a permanent fix. Now, the limit perk disabling love went fairly quickly. We already had the gating logic and were editing a much smaller scope of content. This love was successful and we prepared to deploy this fix to the live game on Sunday. Although it was an option to kick players from the game when we applied the love fix, we chose not to. While the LUP deployment succeeded without major issues, we found that weapons that players already had equipped still had their perks active in certain scenarios. We did not experience that in our internal testing. We then did a rolling restart to get players out of the state, and we considered that the LUP was effective enough to let us concentrate on continuing to help the team who was working on the code fix. Now, for our code fix, we broke down the process into four major, major parts. Number one, stop the exploit so that new weapons cannot enter the system. Number two, determine how to sieve through all the crafted weapons our players have made and separate the affected weapons from the rest. Number three, determine a good state to move irregularly crafted weapons to so that the player is left with a valid crafted weapon. And number four, find ways to validate that these fix-ups made sense on, many, on the many combinations of weapons that are out there and that we didn't erroneously modify other weapons. As we investigated the issue, team members would join a work chat and provide us with reliable reproduction steps and more insight on the scope of the issue. Did I say how much I love our team? As some focused on the fix, others started to develop our test plan and test cases for validation and developing backup plans. After our initial fix was written, we ran it through many testing scenarios and searched our library of weapons for edge cases to put our fix through. The team would chime in with a scenario and we go through and make sure we handled it appropriately. Our fix would grow and shrink in complexity as we fine tune the sieve that we sifted every weapon through. After we had the fix in a good state, we needed to thoroughly test it using weapons copied from tens of thousands of accounts. On top of that, we needed a way for our team to catch cases where the result did not look correct. We did a significant amount of manual testing, but also leaned on recent updates to our automation tools to drive reports of all the fix ups we've made to weapons and generate summary tables that our experts can comb through. This allowed us to reach a higher confidence level sooner. 
Finally, we repeated the process until we understood every questionable behavior and scenario and felt confident in moving forward with the fix. There is a fix deploying this week that will target this crafting issue. As always, please report any issues you are experiencing following the rollout via Bungie Help, Destiny 2 Team Count, or Bungie Forms. It was a massive bug. Guys, we'll be talking about the crafting for years to come. We on our channel are going to make a documentary style video of the crafting. Oh, a, an emblem? I think at this point, Bungie should make an emblem for the crafting. I think it definitely deserves it. Considering like Lord of Wolves had an emblem, Laser Tag Weekend, this needs an emblem. Now, deterministic recall, what does it mean and how is it changing? We've got senior design lead Chris Proctor here with an update on deterministic recall and why players should definitely learn more about this change. But Bungie, why wasn't this included in the Season of the Witch Weapons Preview article a few weeks back? It's a good question. We wanted to observe the system in the wild for a little bit and didn't want this information to get buried in patch notes or a larger weapon balance update like the earlier weapon preview article. The full context is important to understand the purpose and PvP implications of the partial predictability of weapon recoil with this particular system active. So let's dive into it. Take it away, Proctor. Starting in Season 22, all of the following weapons with a Season 22 or later watermark will have what we're calling deterministic recoil set up for them. So all the rifles. Pulse rifles, scout rifles, submachine guns, sidearms, hand cannons, trace rifles, and machine guns. Now, this includes a full auto weapons as well as burst fire and semi automatic primary ammo weapons. These weapons will recoil in a predictable way with sustained fire, allowing players to learn the patterns and compensate for them. You may have seen similar systems in other games, but our implementation is quite different because we release so many weapons a season and drive their gameplay via stats. Importantly, in this case, recoil direction and stability yes those are the driving factors for recoil and then the goal of the system is to make each weapon feel unique with a recoil pattern that can be learned to a degree this will enable players to truly master weapons in a way that wasn't possible with standard destiny 2 recoil which has a fair amount of randomness yes if you look at pulse rifles dude you'll shoot like two bullets and it'll like the third bullet will kick up or kick to the left or something like that note that the pattern of the updated recoil is very similar each time but not exactly the same now, here's how it works. A weapon is set up with a few possible recoil patterns. The weapon will always start with the first pattern. Most of the time, it will run through this recoil pattern until you stop firing for long enough to let the weapon's recoil and accuracy reset completely. Occasionally, somewhere in the first half of the magazine, it will switch to another pattern. Interesting. Now, each bullet fire has a small amount of randomness to it due to the accuracy cone, aka error angle placing the bullets somewhere in a radius around the target board. Now, the entire pattern shifts left and right, dependent on the re weapon's recoil, with the higher recoil direction having smaller horizontal spacing. But even as a recoil direction stat changes, the pattern will still be recognizable. All right, let's take a look. So half the magazine. Now this video shows an abyss defiant high impact auto rifle with 86 recoil and 25 stability firing with no compensation for recoil. You can see that while there is some randomness to the location of each specific bullet impact, the pattern is generally the same. Yeah, I, I know this may look funky to you guys, but dude, just go and go go play like if you go and just like shoot into a wall like an smg or an auto rifle like you'll see like the deviation gets substantially worse for the most part it's random but it it, it is fairly vertical and what was the recoil direction that they gave right here 86 recoil direction 25 civilian all right now some questions and answers why don't fusion rifles shotgun the sniper rifles get this treatment Fusion rifle recoil isn't a big factor in the randomness of the apparent recoil patterns. They're much more dependent on actually cone growth. What we found when we set this up for fusion rifles is that you can't tell there's any predictability to the recoil because accuracy places the bullets so randomly. Shotguns get fixed pellet spread instead. Technically, deterministic recoil would function on shotguns, but you wouldn't be able to feel it in most cases. Making sniper rifle recoil predictable isn't something we're comfortable with doing at this point. It would likely make follow-up shots too easy. And actually, cone growth doesn't have a large enough impact on sniper rifles for this to feel safe. Now, does the recoil pattern only reset on a full magazine? No, 
it resets when you stop firing for long enough for the weapon to fully settle meaning that it's actually cone has gone back to his default resting state so you actually see the bloom of the reticle right when that actually comes back to its default position is when it resets Typically, when you reload, the weapon is idle for long enough for this to happen, though. Now, I'm assuming, by the way, that that is the case for the resting state. Now, what happens if I keep refilling my magazine while continuously firing? The implementation we've used has no upper limit to the length of the recoil pattern. For example, firing an auto rifle with Axiom War Rig or another magazine refill method won't cause any weirdness. Now, are there any security implications to this feature? It was very important that this feature not be exploitable. Weapon design worked with game security on this implementation to ensure that we achieve the goal of allowing greater player mastery of weapons without allowing recoil to be predictable enough to be exploitable. We settled on three prioritizations. Number one, a predictable recoil pattern, but standard randomization in accuracy and error angle. While the pattern is predictable, each bullet will land in a slightly different position each time. Number two, a low chance to branch to a different pattern in the first half of the magazine. Any attempt to use automation to compensate for a specific pattern will randomly fail. And number three, a server side flag to disable this feature so that if we encounter issues, we can revert to standard behavior immediately while we work on a fix. Hopefully that gives you some insight into why the season 22 weapons feel a little different. We'll be monitoring recoil in the live game as well as feedback around the systems and are ready to make adjustments if needed. So if I'm getting this right, guys, this is something as anyone here noticed it, this is already in the game. No, not really. Cobra, I noticed a lot of weapons feel so much better. You know, what's interesting is I actually thought that maybe it was the decoupling of Zoom, but it seems like maybe a combination of the two, right? Zoom, the Zoom changes, the decoupling of Zoom, range changes, and also uh, the Terminus of Recoil. Everyone is lying. No one noticed. I just associated weapons feeling better with the range changes because most weapons got a range buff this past season. Curiosity may kill the cat, but what about the Guardian? You've been exploring the Spire so much that you've discovered its deepest secrets. The mystical arcane chambers where Savathun turned trickery into power. You're free to explore, but try not to become a victim of your own curiosity. Pay extra attention as you make your way through Season of the Witch starting this week, Guardians. Some surprises are still waiting to be uncovered, and not all are easy to spot. Dude, that was a trippy room, by the way. That, that final mission of this week, trippy as hell. Now, what's a controversial Halloween candy in Destiny 2? Candy Thorn. Look, you can admit it. Don't be shy. It's okay to say out loud that you enjoyed the ever-loving traveler out of going fully stabby-stabby with the recently added Monte Carlo Catalyst. We get it. We're not here to judge. In the same vein, have you considered Thorn for your loadout lately? All right, hold on, hold on. Let's look at this. Thorn Catalyst grants bonus range and stability. Dealing a final blow or absorbing a remnant grants additional increased weapon range as well as increased mobility and handling for a short time. Holy. Guys, Thorn is about to be meta. It already feels really good in this sandbox. 69 range, 65 stability. And look, look, look. Dealing final blows or absorbing a remnant grants additional increased range. As well as increased mobility and handling for a short time. That's whether you're getting a remnant or just simply getting a final blow. So you don't have to worry about pushing up to pick up the remnant. You're already getting this. Oh, that's hot. That's hot. Dude, Thorn is about to pop. So, so, so it's essentially killing wind. It will proc, though, on absorbing a remnant. And it's getting flat default stab bumps. They could have just given us this and not given us the stab bumps. Thorn is arguably one of the most iconic exotic hand cannons in Destiny. So it only makes sense that this bad boy is the next weapon up for some catalyst action coming in season 23. And before you ask, no, you can't stab people with it. Guys, this is going to be a, I'm telling you, we are entering a thorn meta. When this catalyst goes live, it's gonna it's gonna be spicy. Bless your pill heart. If you've been digging the lead up into the final shape so far, you've likely already seen the trailer below highlighting the pill heart. If you haven't, buckle up because the next step of this wild destiny journey is going to be a doozy. If you've already seen it, well, watch it again because it's quite frankly awesome. Yeah, guys, we did a, a small breakdown there, uh, pretty much just peeling everything back, but it looks good, man. Final shape is. I just hope narratively they nail it. You know what I mean? Like it, it got to end it. It's got to be on like the level of like Halo 3, considering it's the finale. Okay, but okay, so this is for the new subclasses. Yeah, we're going to have a video out later today, breaking down all of the new supers. So the Warlock super, the Hunter super, the Titan super. We're also doing some D1 comparisons. That will be out later today. We've got some some amazing beats here with Eris. We were listening to it the other day. If you guys want to check that out, I may actually pull that out. And I'm concerned. Look at this. This is Eris. There's a lot of stuff around Eris right now. I'm really concerned. Holy hell, that looks 
That looks wild. I'm really concerned Eris is going to be killed off this season, guys. But um, an amazing, amazing voice actress for him. Uh, more Prime Gaming rewards. That's it, guys. That's your twab. Let me look at known issues just to make sure. Igneous Hammer plus Javelin 4 will return due to the effects of the weapon crafting issue on the previous weekend's instance of Trials of Osiris. Both Igneous Hammer and the Javelin map will be returning to the upcoming Trials of Osiris weekend. There you go. Everybody that was upset about the crafting, it's going to be back again this weekend. Now, Master Crota is in delay. After delay from the intended Tuesday launch, the Master Crota in's raid mode is now available with the release of update 7.2.0.4. Essence of the Oversoul will also see an increase in drop rate. We actually just did the first encounter and the second encounter. First encounter did drop a, a essence for me. Nothing on the second encounter, but we'll give you an update on whether or not that's uh, that's been improved or how drastically it's been improved. Uh, Crota's in 48 hour challenge mode emblem. We're working to ensure players who completed the Crota's in challenge mode within the contest mode window are properly accredited with the all for one triumph and associated emblem. Additional updates will be provided when available. For more information on this issue and the steps being taken to resolve it, please see last week's player support report. Outside of that, guys, these known issues that we have, see a couple of aesthetic issues, ornaments not working, or Frost Icefall Mantle are using the incorrect cooldowns. All right, that's it, guys. That's your twab. Slap that like button like your mama told you right. <laughs>